Welcome back to the Pilots Lounge. On today's episode, we are joined by Casey Kroll, the CEO of the Big Man Foundation. Casey was also a student athlete at James Madison University, where he played football while earning his Bachelor of Science in Public Policy Administration and a Master of Public Administration with a concentration in nonprofit management. After playing football and graduating college, Casey went on to serve as an assistant football coach at Lamar University and then eventually went on to Southern Methodist University where he was an assistant football coach and a graduate assistant. He also attained a Master of Liberal Studies with a concentration in organizational dynamics during his time at Southern Methodist University prior to taking on his CEO role in the Big Man Foundation full time. We're stoked to share with you Casey's wide breadth of experience, both as a student athlete, a mentor, as well as a nonprofit leader in the community. And we can't wait to share that with you. From wherever you're listening, sit back, grab your cup of coffee. And thanks again for joining us on the Pilots Lounge. What's going on, Bartellian? This is John Gray, host of the Hangar Z podcast. We love the Pilots Lounge podcast and know you do as well. Hey, when you're done here, come check out the Hangar Z podcast. We're the first and only podcast promoting the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. You can find us at hangarzpodcast.com or anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Still going on at Brotalian is our Bro Stash Movember t-shirt sale where all profits from the shirt and stickers that are sold will be donated to the Movember Foundation supporting prostate and testicular cancer along with mental health and suicide prevention. Again, that is now through the end of November. There's a t-shirt shop now tab as well as a donate tab on the main page at brotalian.com. Also, mark your calendars from Black Friday through Cyber Monday. 15% of all profits from Brotalian.com on any item are going to be donated to the Brotalian Blue Skies Foundation. During that time, there will be some limited drops uh, that we'll be releasing. We're not going to share the details of what those items are going to be yet. But again, Black Friday through Cyber Monday, 15% all profits donated to the Brotalian Blue Skies Foundation. All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Pilots Lounge. Today is episode 37, and we're having on Casey, my cousin, Casey Kroll from the Big Man Foundation, and we'll be talking about all things 501c3 today and kind of the parallels between our companies and why it's uh, so important to our individual community. So, Casey, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, welcome to the Pilots Lounge, man. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Glad to be here. Sweet. So I did say Casey is my cousin. So I will be bringing up my most fond memory of Casey, which is probably one of my earliest memories of all. And I think I've talked to you about this, Casey, but man, it was probably 95. I mean, when were you born? 92. So I'd been two or three. Yeah, so I would say maybe 96. You're probably four. My uh, uncle from my mom's side, Casey's from my dad's side. He's, his dad is my dad's brother. Big Kev. But anyways, this was back in probably 96. We were taking vacation. Um, we all lived in Michigan at that time, taking vacation up north uh, to my mom's brother's house on a lake way up north, northern Michigan. Um, it was at night. And we had this huge fire pit, this huge bonfire going. Um, and for some reason, Casey just decided to walk straight through it. And uh, <laughs> he, he walked through it unscathed. Uh, nothing touched him. Uh, it was just like crazy. Like I remember seeing it, my dad, everyone watched him walk straight through a bonfire. And uh, yeah, no issues. Could have probably could have done it again if he wanted, but uh but yeah, that's that's my uh, most fond memory, or at least earliest memory of of interacting with you outside of seeing our cousins eat, or Chris, our cousin, eat about twenty uh, pierogi on Christmas dinner one night. <laughs> but uh, Shit, Casey, that's a Casey, badass story to, to lead off on. I, th- I was <laughs> like, when you said when I was like three years old, I was I was going back in the archives trying to figure out what story this is going to be. But I'm glad it was that one. Um, yeah, I promise I'm not like the spawn of Satan or anything. Um, trying to use the gifts I've been given to for good and to help other people and stuff, uh, which we'll get into more. But yeah, it's weird. I 
and I don't want to say I had a, like a bunch of stories like that from my kid. I don't remember that at all, by the way. I just remember the stories of it. Like I remember my dad telling me, but I was almost, when I was born, I was born premature and I was almost like dead. Like my APGAR score was like a two or a three. And so I've always kind of like looked at uh, my past as kind of like uh, maybe I was spared for a reason or something, you know, maybe there's bigger plans for me, but uh, same with maybe walking through a bonfire i don't know but that's at least what i tell myself hell yeah man well hey anyways um you're better for it i'm sure so either way um we like to start the podcast off with uh our um table talk so basically it's um you know we go back and forth asking off the wall obscure questions to kind of get the uh the mind flowing get in that flow state you know what i'm saying um right so, i know i'm with you Without further ado, further ado, uh, I will ask my I ask the first one here. Um, between the two, what's better, truly or White Claw? Is it like is it like anyone goes, or is it is there an order to our answers? It's just for you, Case. Uh, I'm a brand guy, so I'm gonna go with like the White Claw because I feel like Truly's a knockoff, and I, I stuck with the originals. All right, Word. yeah, I respect that. Um, Go ahead, man. Varsity Blues or Remember the Titans? Remember the Titans. For that's like one of my favorite. I'm a football player from Virginia, so like that's a that's a no brainer. That's an easy. That's a layup for me. That's a great movie. Yeah, it's one of my favorites too. You said you were born in '93, right? '92. Shit. All right, one second. Why? <laughs> What are you looking up? He's got I don't some. Think obs- I have a Wikipedia page or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But I always ask my one of my favorite questions is you know Spencer already asked the movie question, but I will give you three movies from 1992 and see what tell me which one is your favorite and why. So I'll tell you my favorite at the end, but um, here they are: Home Alone Two, which is mm. fuck, it's a great one. Wayne's World, or my cousin Vinny. Oh man, I'm um, I'm gonna go Wayne's World for sure. I was Wayne for uh, me and my roommate were Wayne and Garth for Halloween one year in college, and I'll probably watch that movie like a hundred times. This the part I, I don't know if it's Wayne's. I think it's the first Wayne's World. I don't know if it's Wayne's World too, but the uh, like the product placement bit where they talk about sellouts and he's wearing Garth's wearing all the Reebok stuff. That's like my that's one of my favorite movie clips <laughs> of all time. <laughs> Party on. Yeah, absolutely. Spence, you got any more? Yeah, man. Uh, favorite dive bar anywhere in the world? Favorite dive bar anywhere in the world? Um, when I, so I went to James Madison University in Virginia, and there's a dive bar there uh, called Finnegan's Cove, which was like the late night spot. And it was like a towny bar. And then it kind of became like a student bar because it was the only bar in Harrisonburg where you could smoke inside. Uh, yeah, and that wasn't really inside. my thing, but it's just something about the smoke and bar atmosphere. Yeah, just I was drawn to it like a bug to light. So that's one. <laughs> um, my sister lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and I lived in Dallas. And driving back home to Virginia, Nashville was like the midway point it was like nine or ten hours in nashville nine or ten hours home so i'd always make a trip stay a weekend with her and there was a place there called losers that was an awesome bar yes <laughs> um uh, that's and- actually nick the other guy that typically runs a podcast he lives up in clarksville and i think that losers is actually one of his favorites too because there's ones next to it called winners right it's winners and losers yeah, it's like across the street or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 pretty but cool i just thought that's just such a great bar name yeah it is losers um <laughs> And then when I lived in uh, when I lived in Dallas, there was a bar that we always went to called High Fives, and that place was that was a great bar too, like an outdoor, crisp, like colored Christmas light kind of vibe. Nothing too uh, fancy. It was good. It was good. Good spot. Good vibes. What was the name oh, of the yeah. one again in uh, Virginia? Yes, yeah, what I'm doing right now. Finnegan's Cove. Is that right? Finnegan's Cove. Yep. Sweet. Yeah, I keep a master list of this shit in case I'm ever in one of these areas. Yeah, for sure. I'm getting married. I'm getting married in Harrisonburg. So if Brad, if you make it out to the wedding in June, if you can swing it, we'll, I'll buy you first round at Finnegan's Cove. Hell yeah, I'd love to. I don't know if it's going to happen. I can't make any promises, but I'd love to love to come out there, obviously, and support you and your your new spouse. Um, 
but Spence, yeah, we should publish all these favorite uh, dive bars on like the the website on the pub- pilots lounge web- pilots lounge idea. website. Yeah, what's it say um, about me when you ask me for my favorite dive bar and I give you three? It says you're somebody I like to hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take myself too seriously. <laughs> well, hey man, uh, we'll start. I got one just, more. Oh, go ahead. My bad. Oh, that's. I mean, it'll kind of like lead us into probably into K- to uh, Casey and his, you know, where he started and where he's from and his background. But but uh, since we're both cousins and you know most of the the big heads are probably going to be listening to this, you know, um, I, I'd like to ask you what's your <clears throat> fondest or most memorable moment from a Kroll function, a Kroll uh, family function. Oh man, that's a, uh, there's so many, I don't know where to start. My favorite story. I don't remember this actually happening, but was when, the, uh, the VCR mix up. Oh, with, with the family. I don't remember it, but that might be one of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my life. Um, it's like a sitcom quality. Like it's a movie skit. Like it, it I guess this, and Brett, you can probably tell it better than I can, but I guess someone was showing like a home video that was taped over some, they're showing like a home video to the entire like extended family over something like a Christmas recital or something like that. And then the Christmas recital ended in what that Christmas recital was taped over, started playing on the VCR next. And I guess it was an, ad- an adult film. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like grandma saw it. Aunts, our, um, I think Uncle Ed. Cousins. Our, I think Uncle Ed. Uh, uh, the pastor. Our great <laughs> un- uncle's a priest. I think he saw it too. Holy shit. Yeah, the backstory so, uh, on that. The backstory on that. And 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 dad, if, if you're listening, <laughs> sorry, I got to say it. But um and it's past the statute of limitations, so we should be <laughs> good. Fantastic. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I didn't had, sign an NDA or anything about this story, so I think we're good to talk yeah. about it. He had the uh, my dad, my house. We had the you know the bootleg cable. Everyone had the bootleg cable box back in the day. You can get all the channels, you know. So at some point, I think my dad was showing the the uncles, you know the capabilities of the the black box um and i don't think he intended to record it but it somehow got recorded onto a a family uh vcr family video vcr um tape and yeah someone and that was the tape they wanted to look at i think it was from like a birthday or something a couple months back and they threw it in and bam yeah dp going on i think (laughs) oh god I don't know the details I, of it. I could be wrong. I'm sure the fact checkers will come after us, but uh, uh but yeah, it was pretty pretty graphic, pretty uh, explicit. So yeah, it's oh, a so great it wasn't story. Just like I'm, a little little warm up, soft core, and little no, kids it was hugging. It. Oh, just getting after it. There was there was <laughs> no the there was no foreplay. It was st- straight to uh <laughs> straight to the 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 home run. So yeah. Man, oh, that's a man, great one. I'm gra- good. glad you brought we, that up. Should we segue and talk about some charity stuff now? Kinda... <laughs> yeah. Uh. Um, I guess Casey just starting off uh, outside of the aforementioned experiences. Um, <clears throat> you know, where are you from originally? Obviously, everyone knows we're related, but, uh, you know, where are you from? And, you know, just give us a brief overview of your your upbringing, I guess. Yeah, for sure. And I don't want to be, I'm, I'll try not to be too long winded on it, but yeah, like Brett said, originally from, uh, I was born in Michigan, lived there, grew up all around the state. We moved like every few years across, like around the state of Michigan, like a f- hour or two from like where we lived before. So, um, it's hard. I, I lived there when I was a kid, so I don't know like the names of the cities or the geography or anything, but, uh, lived across Michigan for like the first like 12 or 13 years of my life. And then it was like a few weeks before I started my freshman year of high school, my family moved to a suburb of, of DC. We live in Virginia, um, small sleepy town, kind of an hour South of DC called Warrington, Virginia. So grew up there, um, high school there, uh, went to college like an hour and a half from there and even smaller, sleepier town called Harrisonburg, Virginia, went to James Madison university. Um, was fortunate to be a member of the football team there from 2011 to 2015. 
Um, it's an FCS school, so it's Division One, but it's kind of like a, like there's the F, FBS Division One, FCS Division One. When I was at JMU, we were FCS, and then they recently just transitioned. This is their first year as an FBS team, and they started the season this year pretty strong. They were, won five games. I think they broke the top twenty-five, which was which was huge for a first-year FBS school. So. Went there, played there. Uh, student athlete experience there was probably the best thing to ever happen to me. Had some awesome coaches um, to the point where uh, they inspired me to to want to go into coaching, um, just because I thought it was an awesome career path. It was kind of kind of against the grain. It was a cool job, um, but the most the thing that stuck out about it to me was I had these great coaches my junior and senior year that kind of used their passion was you know serving young men and developing young people and they just kind of use football as a vehicle to do that and I was like man that's awesome and so I was fortunate I, I had these conversations with my coach my senior year at JMU like while I was still playing telling him that like I'm thinking about this I'd like to learn from you and he kind of extended like an opportunity for me to kind of learn under him as his little like assistant padawan gopher whatever you want to call it um, but I attached myself to him and I did that with him that next year 2016 at James Madison um, moved across the country with that coach, uh, in the same capacity. I was like his little assistant understudy, graduate assistant, went to a few schools. Um, and that's how I got into coaching and lived in Texas for a few years. And then I moved back to Virginia, right. At the beginning of the pandemic. What was that Spencer? Is that a horn frogs? No, it wasn't a SMU. Isn't their thing like pony? Oh no, yeah. The, it's the SMU is the pony, which is like, two fingers it's supposed to be like donkey ear like pony ears and then the oh, okay. horn frog is like just a little bit ah. bent finger so it's, it's a little confusing and they're rivals too so it's i'm probably gonna get some shit i'm gonna i'm an smu alum so i'm gonna get some shit for that one am i allowed to cuss yes or? okay yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah that's that's kind of my personal story um so during your during your coaching career a little bit, you, you know, there was some unfortunate circumstances that, um, you know, had a profound effect on, I forget coach's name. Was it Jamal Powell? Yeah. Um, coach Powell. Can you talk, um, a, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what him and his family went through and how it impacted you? Um, and then, you know, what inspired you to sort of move into what you're doing today? Yeah, sure. And so, uh, yeah, my my coach. He was my coach my senior year at JMU. Was named Jamal Powell, and he was a, like he was a young up and coming coach. He would have been, and I say this all the time, but I, I truly believed he was going to be like a coaching superstar, um, like SEC level, NFL level coach if he would have stayed healthy. And so he was the right guy for me to attach myself to. And that's how a lot of young coaches make it in the coaching profession too. Is you make yourself valuable to a coach, and hopefully it's an up and coming coach and they kind of bring you along and that's how you kind of, you kind of climb the ladder with them. And so that's kind of the deal we had going. And, uh, we moved, he was originally from Texas. And so after that one year, the 2016 at JMU, he wanted to move back closer to home. He's from Houston. So we went to a school called Lamar university for one year, which was an FCS school. And then after one year there, he kind of got his break and he got hired to be the, the offensive line coach at SMU, which is like, a story program in Texas is FBS program. And, uh, you know, it, the, the pay increases like double or triple or quadruple what he was making as an FCS coach. So we we're fired up that we we're excited about that one. And then shortly after we got to SMU, so we got to SMU in January of 2000 and I think it would have been 2018. Um, yeah, 18 he was diagnosed like that summer it was right before i went home for like a month he was diagnosed with something called guillain barre syndrome or gbs which is where like your central nervous system attacks your autoimmune system or vice versa i can't remember which one but within the course of like a few weeks and coach powell was like he played at tcu he was like a remington award finalist which is like the top interior lineman in college football when he played he played in the nfl for two years he played Canadian football for a few years. So he's a professional offensive lineman, um, big, strong. I mean, he's like 315 pounds, maybe even bigger. He's huge. One of the strongest people I'd ever seen in my life, just natural too. Um, but within a few weeks, he was in a wheelchair. He he lost uh, 
feeling in his hands and his legs. So he could like move them, but he couldn't feel anything. So like he couldn't grab anything. He couldn't walk. Um, so he's in a wheelchair. He couldn't feed himself, couldn't go to the bathroom by himself, uh, all of that. And so he was in the hospital for a few months, came home. His wife, they had three young, they have three young kids. Um, and then she had to help with him almost full time. And so my role, and at this point too, is like, I'd lived with the family before I babysat the kids. I was kind of looked up to him and his wife as like my, uh, older siblings that I never had, had a really, it wasn't just like my boss, you know, it was like, they were like my family at this point. And so I kind of helped out when I could and watch the kids while he was in the hospital or Mrs. Powell was in the hospital with him. Um, and it was just a really kind of, it was just really shitty. Like it was a really bad, it's one of those things where it's like the sooner you can catch it and diagnose it, the faster the recovery is, but for whatever reason, they couldn't figure out what it was. And so by the time they figured out what it was, it was really set in and it made the recovery a lot harder. And he had all kinds of complications over the next like year from the, from the GBS. Um, then he found out he had stage three colon cancer, which is serious. And so they removed his colon, which for guys they do is like a last resort because there's all kinds of complication or side effects that come from removing your colon that really can mess with like your male psyche. Um, so it was a last resort. So they were pretty desperate to stop the spreading, stop the cancer and stop the spread of it. And so they removed his colon started recovering from that and then he tried to do chemotherapy um but was just so weak from the gbs that he couldn't really stick to a chemo routine and uh about a year later found out that the cancer had spread to his stomach um did the best he could to fight it and then ultimately he ended up passing away he was four days shy of his he passed away in 2021 he was four days shy of his 40th birthday and so and he survived by Miss Powell and their, and their three young kids. They still live outside of Dallas. Um, they're both from Texas. So after kind of seeing that and what they went through, I was a lot like Coach Powell and the fact that, like, I got into college football, not necessarily because I love football. I do love football. Um, I love coaching football, and I love being around the the, the young athletes. The college, I would love working with college-age athletes. It was awesome. But my true passion, I kind of realized, was serving others and helping others. And so – I actually talked to Coach Paul about it before he passed away and kind of asked for like his blessing and kind of told him my heart wasn't in coaching anymore and that I kind of had this idea and I wanted to go pursue it and I wanted to move back home and do it. Um, I told him about the idea of starting a charity to help not only make sure his family's taken care of, but helping other families that might experience something like what him and his family went through. And so we started the Big Man Foundation and started doing the paperwork for it all the administrative stuff, registering with the state and the IRS, all that. And it was during the pandemic. So it was like the summer of 2020 was when we started. And then we launched it almost exactly a year, two years ago. It was G December 1st, 2020. So did that, grew it, um, worked for a couple of years as a volunteer basis, uh, just kind of getting it off the ground. And then a few months ago, I went full time doing it. Yeah, it's super liberating, man, to go all in. Spencer knows, you know, <clears throat> uh, something I'm familiar with too. So kudos on you for going in and, and, you know, chasing your dream, taking risks. Yeah, and that's what everyone, you know, everyone has their opinion on it. And everyone tried it. Some people tried to, some people are like gung-ho, like, yeah, you got to do it. That's the only way. Like I started a business and, we, you know, we grew marginally until I – quit my job until it was like sink or swim and then we took off and i'm like okay cool but then there's a lot of other people that are like what you know that's gonna mess with your retirement how are you gonna this this is it might not work what, what's it gonna work at but to me it was like what's the risk for me the risk is that it fails and then i get another job and hopefully we help some people along the way but you know if it doesn't work out then i'll figure something else out you know i'm still i was born in 92 so i'm not that old but that shoe dog um, quote, Spence. Yep. Yeah, um, or shoe dog. Oh, dude. So dare to uh, take not, chances, lest you leave your talent buried in the ground. Yep. Uh, highly recommend you read the book Shoe Dog. It's actually what inspired me to do exactly what you were just describing. Um, when I was 
in grad school and had originally other plans. It's just uh, it's Phil Knight's memoir, basically, on how he started Nike. Um, oh, I've heard of it. I've heard that. Before. Yeah, regardless, I've, heard the book. I've never read it. I'll have yeah, to read it. It's uh, I did it on audiobook, man, and just fucking I listened to it twice. It was incredible. I think you'd resonate with a lot of it based on what we've talked about so far in this episode, and then you know also being an athlete and appreciation for athletics and stuff as well. There's there's a lot of tie-ins, I think. Um, but yeah, man, kudos to you for uh, defying the norm. You know, like like you said, different opinions and looks. Um, I would say the majority of the people that I talk to are like, wonder if I'm like unemployed or what the fuck I'm even doing. They just don't necessarily understand it or comprehend it because it's not the safe move and most people don't do it. Um, so again, good for you for for pursuing a passion and stuff. So backtracking a little bit, we we talked about, you know, growing up playing football, playing college football, coaching college football, your mentor. Talk to us a little bit about what the big man foundation does um you know can you give us an example of uh you know recent story of you know perhaps somebody that you've helped um because you know we're we're big on community and stuff here and we'd love to help promote um what you guys are doing and so help paint a picture to our audience with what bmf is trying to get after yeah for sure and so i'll start by saying like our name the big man foundation comes from coach powell so a lot of like our core values and the way that our decisions when we were kind of formulating what the organization was going to look like and when we were laying the foundation uh was inspired by coach powell and so he kind of his legacy kind of lives on through our organization now but the name coach powell used to call the offensive line unit which is like the big guys on the football field he used to call us the big man fraternity and so we kind of borrowed from that to come up with the name Big Man Foundation. And then I'm sure you can guess too, like there's also like a second meaning, there's a hidden meaning for the term BMF, but we leave that to the audience's imagination, to the to the public's imagination. Um, and it was the same when we were the offensive line too. So that's where our name comes from. And then our mission is to uh, help alleviate and prevent hardships for athletic coaches and their families. And um, we help coaches and family mem- like immediate family members for all coaches all sports uh any level of competition anywhere in the country so it's not just like college football coach thing it's any coach rec league travel whatever volleyball ice hockey um the only catch is that it's athletic coaches because i didn't want any like career coaches trying to get in on a grant or something like that and so um, how we help people, how we kind of serve the coaching community is twofold. So the first thing that we do, and this is what we kind of started the organization around was being able to give emergency financial assistance to families when they need help, when some kind of tragedy, like what the Powell's went through happens. And so, uh, we give out grants to families in need that go to our website and they can apply for a grant. And then we kind of review the grant internally and figure out how we can help and the best way that we can help. Um, and that's kind of evolved too, because a lot of times when a family needs help, they don't necessarily need financial help. And if they do most, they've already probably started to go fund me. And so we kind of use our resources that we have with our board and our, uh, kind of what we can do as a 501 C three, which I always have to preface to coaches. 501 C three means that we're tax exempt charity. It's not a bra size. Um, but, So we try and give out like other resources to help coaches as well, um, kind of support them emotionally. Um, We try and think of things that other people haven't thought of as a way to help coaches. And so it's really kind of interesting because um, like when these hardships happen, all the family is focused on is overcoming the hardship and it's like tunnel vision. That's all they can think about. And they don't even necessarily like know what they need or how we can help. And so we're able to kind of go with to them now with a menu and say like, Hey, we can give you, if you need financial help, we can try and help you with financially, but here's a list of a bunch of other things that we could help you with right now to kind of navigate this hardship that you're going through. And it could include like uh, daycare, grocery shopping, house cleaning service, uh, all of those kind of things, uh, laundry service, go do the kids laundry, their laundry, uh, while they're in the hospital or doing whatever. And so that's one of the ways we help is through the resources and the, and the grants. And then the second thing we're going to try, we're going to do starting next year is, um, trying to take a proactive role in the coaching community and 
kind of addressing health and wellness to coaches because it's almost paradoxical, but it's a health and wellness industry. Like coaches work in a health and wellness industry, but sometimes there's some of the most like unhealthy people ever, like 1500 milligrams of caffeine a day. They don't sleep. They're on the road recruiting all the just junk food. They don't exercise because they're watching film. And so it's a really unhealthy. And if you're sick or something's wrong, you don't go to the doctor and you, you tough it out. And it's, it's old school, but, and I kind of like that it's old school, but it's also really unhealthy. And so just kind of trying to do our part and taking a proactive role and helping and preventing these hardships from happening in the first place. And so starting next year, next spring around coach Powell's birthday, we're going to do like a health and wellness. We haven't decided if it's going to be a week or a day, but something where we can get in front of coaches at a school university, blast it out over our, our website, social media and stuff that just kind of highlights health and wellness best practices and then encourages just like a health checkup day for coaches to go get evaluated by a doctor or get a physical of blood work done if they haven't had it done in a decade or whatever um to once again maybe prevent the next coach pile from happening because the reality is is uh his cancer could have been treated if he would have gotten tested earlier um but for whatever reason while he was healthy he just didn't didn't get the health checkup didn't go to the doctor because he didn't have time to, or he thought he said he didn't have time to, cause he was a coach and uh, his situation could have been a lot different if it would have been diagnosed and treated earlier. So that's, that's what we do to, those are the two ways that we really try and serve the, the athletic community. And that was long winded. So if you need me to break that down or if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Um, do you, um, how do you sort of focus on spreading awareness throughout the coaching community? Do you have volunteers that are members of that community that are coaching and, you know, said sports at certain levels and stuff, or what's your, um, obviously we understand your relationship to coaching, but who, how do you get kind of down to like the front lines with regards to helping people with this kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, it's something too, like, and I'm sure you guys well know with, with the blue skies foundation and stuff, like we put so much work into it and we thought it was such a good idea and we're, it was going to change the world. And we had a, a great story behind what we were doing that we thought it was going to be like an overnight, not sensation, but we thought that it would really pick on quick or catch on pretty quick. And so we opened up the grants on our website and I was just expecting to, you know, I was freaking out. I'm like, how are we going to go through all these grants? How are we going to determine who gets how much and stuff? What are our internal practices to ensure that, you know, we're, we're fair to everybody. And it was like crickets, like no grants came in. And so then we kind of, I kind of took a step back and was like, well, we can't help people if they don't know that we're a resource for them. And so we really have to kind of focus on the marketing and letting coaches know that. And so we became really aggressive this past year about just going out to like coaches clinics, coaching conventions, having a booth, exhibiting, uh, getting every speaking engagement we could. We started a podcast where we kind of bring on coaches and just, we don't really talk about like the X's and O's, but we talk about just like what coaching is, why you like coaching coaches that inspired you to become a coach, have those kind of conversations. And, uh, obviously social media is a big part of it. And, um, going on as many other podcasts as we can to kind of spread awareness about our organization, our mission. And we have seen it kind of start to pay off. We actually had someone, um, like the first few grants we gave out to families in need were families that like we found on the internet or we saw someone else share on Twitter and we were able to reach out to them. But a few months ago, we actually had someone refer someone to us, which was big because for us, we were like, well, that means it's working because now people in the community know that we're a resource for coaches and they can push people our way when they need help. And so we were really proud of that. And we were able to, we just awarded a grant last week to that family that they referred to us. And so we were, we were really proud of that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It, it's always uh, a good feeling when the people from inside the community you're trying to support are starting to tell each other and, and uh, you know, about what you're trying to accomplish and stuff. It's like the perfect use case that you're doing the right shit. And then you start getting that organic growth, which is, you know, the ultimate goal, I think, Brett, you got something rather. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think that's, I'm just kind of piggybacking off what you said, but the hardest part when you're running a nonprofit, I think is, is earning and gaining and maintaining the community's trust. So that's something that we went through with some of our first, um, 
you could call it grants or fundraising opportunities due to a loss, um, you know, and we're, we're trying to advocate our, our mission on behalf of, you know, the community to this family or whatnot. And you're trying to step all the right ways so that, you know, when the next incident occurs, which it will, it's not if it's when, you know, people are calling you, um, without you having to do anything. Um, so you can get the wheels turning. So, yeah, I think that's huge is getting the trust. And then once you have it, it's gonna, it's gonna, those referrals and those grants will start flowing. Yeah. And it, it's really helped us too. And this kind of answers the, the question you just asked Spencer, but, um, I have a great board that I, I guess technically I work for because legally like that's how we're structured is like I report to the board. So we have eight board members that all kind of bring their own skill to the table. So like some people have a communications background, a PR background. Um, one of our board members was a football coach for like 30 years. And so he knows at, at the division one level. So he knows like everybody. So if it's like, Hey, we well, this person would be a good person to talk to. He's like, uh, yeah, let me make a phone call. And so, He's a great asset. We have an NFL player, uh, one of uh, Aaron Stinney, plays for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, is on our board, and college football coach is on our board. And so um, I'm really proud of that and be able to work with them. And a lot of nonprofits, they use like the board as like a fundraising mechanism where it's like the board members don't really do anything except give a lot of money each month or each year or whatever to be on the board. And the way I kind of looked at it was like, I don't really. W- w- we'll find ways to go raise the money, but I'd rather work with people that are passionate about our mission and want to, and see the idea and want to help us grow it. You know, I don't really care to just have someone critique me and, and give a lot of money each month. That's not really what I'm looking to get out of a board. So I'm lucky to have a pretty engaged, passionate board to work with. And they, they inspire me and they have a ton of great ideas that I'm able to, that we're able to come up with a plan and capitalize on. Yeah, I think we're right there with you too on our side of things. Um, you know how how did you how did you develop your board? I mean, how did you um, you know recruit those people and 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 get such a a solid group of folks that are passionate about what what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, it's funny. It's everyone's kind of come on organically, naturally. They heard about what we're doing and and signed on, but it really started with. Um, when I was at, I did grad school at James Madison while I was, pl- I was there for like five and a half years as, as a football player. And so I got my, I was fortunate to get my grad degree from there. And like, obviously my grad degree was like the last year and a half, two years of my time there. And at that point I knew I was going to be a football coach. I did, had no interest in pursuing what I was studying, which was nonprofit management and uh, public administration. And so I was always a good student and I took my schoolwork very seriously, but I think my professors kind of knew that like my passion wasn't in what I was studying, but luckily I didn't burn any bridges or didn't, didn't, wasn't like the typical student athlete in class or anything. Because when I first, when we first had the idea, um, the idea for the foundation came from my college roommate who we were starting, we wanted to do like a GoFundMe for the Powells. And he was the one that pushed me to, he's like, maybe we have something bigger here than a GoFundMe. Maybe we can create an organization that helps the Powells and other people. And I was like, that's a good idea, but I have no idea where to start. And so I reached out to one of my former professors from James Madison and just asked her, I'm like, can I come and just shark tank this to you and tell me, you please just be honest with me. Like this idea sucks. It'll never work. Or someone else is already doing that way better than you ever could. You don't waste your time. Like just shoot me straight. And so I pitched it to her and she told it, she told us that she thought it had legs and, uh, flash forward a couple of years and she's our board president now. And she's, uh, involved. She's been a huge asset for us as we've grown from a grassroots. We didn't take out any loans or hire any lawyers to start. We, it was just hundred percent grassroots incorporated ourselves, wrote our own bylaws and everything. And, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to do that without her help. So I'm very grateful for her. And then other people have kind of come along, uh, along the way. And so like Aaron Stinney, who plays for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, well, he also played for coach Powell and was like, I want to be involved because I know I want to honor coach Powell's legacy. And I want to do that by getting involved with the charity. And we're like, I absolutely please do. And so he did the NFL every year last year, they every year they have like a week where they do my cause, my cleats, where this, where the athletes can wear like a custom cleat for a charity. And Aaron did 
the big man foundation for his cleats, which was like probably like the biggest up until at that point, it was by far the biggest like publicity thing that we had had to that point to in general. So that was really big for us and something that he didn't have to do, but made a huge difference for our organization and the awareness of our brand and of our mission. And so, uh, same thing. We have a, someone on our board is works in fundraising at Penn state works in athletic fund fundraising. And he was coach Powell's neighbor. And when he heard about it, he was like, Hey, I have a background in fundraising. I'd love to be a part of it. And we're like, absolutely. That's someone that we need that someone that adds value to our board. And he's been awesome so far. And so, uh, people are either connected to coach Powell or connected to the coaching community and, and see what we're trying to do and have offered to come on. And we, we vet them and we don't say yes to everybody, but, uh, a lot of people that are passionate and have a, a skill set that we need will definitely welcome. Absolutely, dude. Uh, it's cool to hear that everyone, you know, jumped on and it was kind of organic like that. Um, that 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 shows automatically, you know, what you have is something super special. So that's really cool. Um, <clears throat> now moving forward, you know. What, I guess, what um, gave you the confidence to kind of go all in on on things? Um, well, I, to be honest with you, I was kind of on the fence about it where I was like, I don't know, because I kind of knew what we had in the bank. And I'm don't get me wrong, like I'm not making a killing doing this as a CEO. I'm making about like what a public school teacher would make doing it for the first year until we can kind of establish it a little bit more. But I was a little hesitant because it is a huge risk and like, I'm not risk averse by any means, but when it's, you know, your livelihood, it's a little bit different. And so I, I thought about it and I was like, I don't know, maybe we're a year away. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should, you know, stay in my job for another year and then go do it full time. But my board was the one that was like, listen, we're either going to keep kicking the can down the road and we're going to grow marginally. And the situation is going to maybe change in the next year, or we can go all in and, really get this thing off the ground and ultimately they I, obviously i had to agree to it but they voted in a board meeting to create a position for me and it got approved and then I, that's how it happened so it happened in june and then i started in august damn dude that's really cool so it's a bright forward-thinking board yeah that's awesome um yeah, that that had to be scary, but at the same time, you know, you got all those those uh, pretty experienced people behind you. So, and like you said, what's the worst case scenario? You you go back and you know move move forward and just get a different job somewhere. So, um. right, and and like you said earlier, it is very liberating um, to be able to. I, I mean, technically. I work for myself. I set my own schedule, and so I report to a board. So it's not like I'm a entrepreneur with total freedom or anything, but being able to kind of have an idea and pursue it has been awesome, especially coming from like, uh, like being a, on the bottom of the totem pole in the coaching community, you know, like as a graduate assistant, which is like a step above the student intern, which is the very bottom of the totem pole. It's, a. Uh, you know, you didn't really get much say, like maybe it, once in a while I got to play in the game plan and that was it. Other than that, I was just at a computer breaking down film, you know, setting up drills at practice, that kind of stuff. And so it has been nice to actually have, be able to make like meaningful decisions. And a lot of times they don't work, but you learn from them and you make different decisions the next time. And so I really enjoyed the entrepreneurial part of running the organization so far. So if, you know, looking into the future, and obviously we talked about your all's mission and the different options that you have to, uh, to support that. If you were to say, you know, five, 10 years down the road, where, where is your organization at and what are you guys doing? Yeah, I think the answer to that would be, you know, I'd like to grow the organization to the point where like right now we can, when we give a grant, we can give what we can afford to give. And I know it helps to, de to a degree to the families that we award the grants to. But I think in our vision of like what we are doing, it would be, at least for the grants, would be able to give out more grants and give out more impactful grants to families in need. So instead of saying like, hey, 
we'll get us in contact with your lender. We're going to be able to pay your mortgage for the next few months mm -hmm. to say like, we're going to be able to pay off your mortgage so that you can focus on all you worry. All you have to worry about is overcoming this hardship. You don't worry yeah. the finances, nothing. You don't have to worry about anything else. So that's my vision for that. And then when it comes to like the outreach kind of side of it and this preventative wellness campaign, you know, this, this first year, we're going to have a few schools sign up to do it and that'll be big and we're going to celebrate it. And then the next year we're going to have a few more schools do it and that'll be big and we're going to celebrate it. But each year we do it, it's going to get bigger and our sample size is going to get bigger. And eventually it might be five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now, whenever, but a coach is going to go in and get this health screening and they're going to, the doctor's going to say like, do you were a week away from a widow maker heart, heart attack and we caught it and we're able to get you treatment and we'll be able to prevent what happened to coach Powell or what could have happened to this family. And that's when it'll be really cool to say like, man, I'm glad we did this. If we wouldn't have done this, this family's entire future would be different. And we are able to, to create something that's actually making the world a better place and saving people and saving families. So that's what I'm looking forward to the most over the next few years. So we continue to grow and, and grow to scale. I love that, man. I think that's incredible. Um, Brett, do you have anything else, brother? Yeah. Um, and as you look at both kind of our professions here as, you know, what you, what your community is and who our community is, uh, both pretty selfless individuals, you know, um, from your side, coaching is extremely selfish, excuse me, selfless, um, you know, crazy hours, always gone, always gone from family. And that's, you know, pretty consistent with most people in the military. So right. Moving one, all the time. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and one thing that, you know, often gets overlooked even more than physical health is mental health and, and kind of self introspection and, 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 and placing importance on understanding yourself and mindfulness. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's something that, you know, uh, is often said in the military. It's just kind of like a buzzword, right? Mental health, but what does it really mean? And, you know, I think that as we move forward too, it'll, it, it could become a portion of our foundation in some way. And, you know, obviously it is part of yours too, but, you know, I kind of wanted to use the time to, to see what your thoughts are, you know, as, as you, as you go through and, you know, you had your coaching experiences, you know, and watched other coaches, you know, do you, do you feel that there was a, um, a lack of, you know, support and awareness for mental health as well? Yeah, it's one of those things. And it's, it's, I have my thoughts on it. And I was very like, when I first started hearing, and it was after I got done playing is when I first started hearing about like mental health and mental health and student athletes. And I was kind of, not on the fence about it, but I was a little skeptical at first because in order to be an athlete, especially at a higher level, division one level in any sport, it takes it. I think I didn't understand the difference in mental health and mental toughness, I guess, because it takes a degree of mental toughness. And that kind of comes with the territory of being a high level athlete is like playing in high pressure situations and having to execute and stuff. And so I was a little almost like confused by it. And then I actually had someone explain to me recently, uh, her name is Donna Rogers, and she runs an organization uh, towards spreading awareness on student athlete mental health, explain the difference between like on the field mental toughness and off the field mental health. And it really kind of uh, opened my eyes to the that whole subject a little bit more. And I'm a lot more receptive to it now. And there is a big need for it. And I think one of the things that um, I think I feel most passionately about is how kind of your emotional health, your physical health and your mental he health are kind of all interconnected. Um, where by serving one, if you're only serving one of those three, then you're not really serving all of them. And it, it's kind of health and wellness. Isn't just a go outside for a walk. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, so I think there's a big need for it, but I think when it comes to our organization, and this is something that came from that same conversation with Donna Rogers at Morgan's message was, a. Uh, you know, there's, you, I could name off the top of my head, probably like 17 nonprofits that deal that their mission is something related to student athlete mental health. But there's not a lot for like coaches mental health or coaches like education about mental health. 
which is a really a missing link because the people that have the most impact over the student athletes, mental health is the coaches. And so if there's anyone that needs to know about mental health or red flags or how to deal with a mental health crisis, it needs to be coaches. And so we have actually started to develop like a strategic partnership with that organization. And that's going to be something like when we do our coaches wellness week or day or whatever, we're going to get resources from them to share with coaches about mental health and mental health best practice. Cause that's the thing for me is like, I'm not a mental health expert. I'm not a health and wellness expert. I'm just a washed up old football coach that's running a charity trying to help some people. And so I, I don't pretend to be the subject matter expert and I try and get those resources from people that actually know more about the subject than I do. Um, so I lean on them for that, but I can play a part in getting those resources to the right people to make a difference. That's kind of how I see it. So that's something that we're, we're going to, that we're trying to do with mental health and even like, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, but November is like men's health awareness month. And I think it's called, like I see Spencer's mustache. A lot of people grow mustaches. I think it's yeah, Mo- Movember, November. November. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We grow really mustaches to spread awareness for men's mental health related topics. And uh, obviously a big part of that is mental health, but we were looking at an infographic and we were using it for like our social media or something. And I knew that men's health was an issue, but I didn't know the statistics. And then I started looking at this infograph and it was like a, from verified sources and stuff. It wasn't just like someone made this on Canva. This is from like a a hospital or it was peer reviewed and everything. But this, the stats for guys are like, it was alarming, like, like 24% less likely to go to the doctor than women. And like, half of that would be for anything preventative so like way less likely to go for preventative but like one in every two men will get cancer at some point and there are a lot men will get cancer in some point in their lives four times more likely to commit suicide um and then the one that really blew me away because it made me think of coach powell was how half of premature deaths in men are preventable which is a crazy statistic so there's definitely and i bet that the statistics are even higher in coaching or even like the, uh, you guys would know better than I would like the military, but anywhere where there's kind of like that toughness kind of, we don't get sick. You don't say anything's wrong. You, you tough it out. Like I get that. And there's a time and place for that mentality, but it's, it can be very unhealthy. And so we have a role to play in, in addressing that and as long with, as, as health and wellness in general, but especially mental health in our coaching community. Absolutely, man. And yeah, <clears throat> uh, November is, uh, men's health awareness month, uh, not just, you know, prostate and testicular cancer, but suicide prevention and understanding of mental health and what it really means. Not like exactly like you said, not, not that mental toughness, that, that inherent, you know, athlete attitude, but, um, you know, the mindfulness aspect of things and understanding why you're doing certain things, you know, looking into yourself and kind of figuring out what's what's driving what so it's really important shit you know we have in the military and in general the the buzzword of oh mental health mental health and then obviously suicide goes along with it so um understanding what it really means and what it means that you what you need to do individually to to manage yourself is really important i think the military lacks that education too, right? Automatically, people just say, oh, well, mental health, what does it mean? Go see a therapist. Well, no, that's not what it means. It means education on how to read into yourself. It's it, right, mental, like health, mental health. Self awareness almost. It, yeah, mental health starts with you, right? And we, we in the military like to blame everyone for, you know, when someone takes their own life and, you know, they're, if someone's negligent, they're negligent. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it's something that each individual needs to, to manage. But, um, yeah, Movember is a, is a great opportunity. It's kind of gotten me thinking about that all this month, kind of what you're talking about. And, uh, you know, we're doing a campaign for Movember. Um, we did kind of a t-shirt with our bro stash logo and it's a baby blue t-shirt to, um, symbolize men's health and, uh, all the profits will go to, the Movember foundation, but, um, but yeah, it's important thing. And it's something I'd like to integrate into our foundation somehow at some point. Um, but, uh, I want to thank you for giving us, you know, uh, 
your take on and your understanding and how you developed your board and everything like that, because that's something that we're working on too. Um, so we might be calling you back to get some more info and some advice here soon. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's been the biggest learning curve for me has been uh, like going from college football coaching at the division one level to nonprofit, like college football coaching, arguably like one of the most competitive cutthroat industries. in I would say the entire world. And now I'm in nonprofits and like, I'm all shell shocked. Like, I think everyone's out to get me paranoid, stealing my ideas and stuff. And then I'm in, now I'm in nonprofit management and it's the most collaborative, like what's best for you is best for the, for everyone and help making the world a better place. And we'll help you any way we can, even if it's from like someone competing for the same resources as you. So it's been a lot different. Uh, it's taken me a little getting used to, but yeah, if there's anything I can ever do for you all, uh, let me know love to help hell yeah bro hey casey um, we really appreciate you coming on um tonight man i know you're a busy guy and um you don't have endless amounts of free time floating around so it really means a lot to me and brett for you to spend an hour or so with us and um hopefully somebody in our audience is able to uh relate this to maybe themselves or somebody that they know and can help spread that organic growth that we were talking about a little bit from inside your community um this is a little non-traditional, you know, typically we have on, um, aviators or pilots or whatever, and, you know, we'll ask those individuals for a piece of advice moving forward. Um, Brad, I don't know what you think about on this one for asking him a piece of advice. I don't know if you want to apply it to taking a risk on yourself, the, uh, entrepreneurship or following a passion. If you think you have a good idea, you know, actually going and finding somebody to talk to, what do you think? Maybe we, we hit him on for this, uh, last question. Yeah, I think we, we look at kind of where you are in your life and the decisions you've made and in your experiences as a as a student division one athlete and a and a coach. And, you know, if you had say if you looked at yourself, I don't know, maybe four years ago, three years ago, what what advice would you give yourself? Yeah. And I know like the cliche when it comes to like starting your own business or a charity or something is like, Oh, I wish I would have done it sooner. That's the advice I'd give myself would be three or four years ago, start it then, then we'd be way ahead now. But I think in reality, like when I think about it, when I look back on it, I think the, the best piece of advice that I could have given myself that isn't necessarily I needed this advice, but it would probably be the most helpful advice I could have gotten would have been, um, just to be a good person to everybody because you would never know down the road who could help you or who would want to help you. And I think the case in point is like my professor, who's the president of our board and has really played a pivotal role in us getting from a grassroots nonprofit to a more established nonprofit. Like if I would have just been a piece of shit football player that showed up to class sometimes and was late, headphones in, hood up, like when I reached out to her a few years later, she wouldn't have, she would have had no reason to give me the time of day to hear me out about my idea, let alone get involved with it and help me, help me grow it. And that goes, this, that's the same for everyone else that has decided to get involved that I'd known from a, from coaching or from school or a student athlete or whatever. And so, um, just, you never know who, who, whose path you're going to cross or who can, who can be on your side down the road. And so just try and do good by everyone. Absolutely, man. The world's small, comes around, goes yeah. around. Karma is a real thing too. So that's uh, it's awesome Amen. words to live by. No matter you, know, no matter what you're doing, where you're at in life, you know, keep keep all those bridges bridges open and um, yeah, based. Dude. On, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I guess if you know, can you go ahead and uh, let all let the audience know where to reach you and where to um, where to donate, where to support and where do you look you guys up? Yeah, for sure. Our, our, uh, our website is the big man And then, um, I, I don't know what all our handles are off the top of my head, but I know they're on our homepage on our website. If you go to the big man you can follow us on social media and that's kind of the best way to stay engaged or signing up for the newsletter on our website. And that's one of those things where it's like, we definitely don't do it for the social media and I dread the social media. I hate doing it, but you kind of have to do it. Um, but it does make a difference too, especially now that we're trying to get some bigger whales involved, like some companies and uh, some more private sector grants and stuff. Uh, 
that's actually one of the things that they look at is like, well, what's your following? Because if we want people to know that we're giving our money to charities, which I don't blame them for. But so when they look at that stuff, it matters. So if, if you'd be willing, if you're listening to this and you'd be willing to follow us or engage with us, that would go a long way in helping us. Uh, it's, it's a very easy way for us to continue to kind of grow and help coaches. And then uh, other than that, we have, we have a podcast that you can listen to on uh, anywhere that you listen to podcasts called Coach Talk that's hosted by yours truly, um, which again, I did not want to do, but my board voted for me to do it. So I have to do it. Um, but, but I've actually started to enjoy it a little bit, especially after working from home by myself. I kind of appreciate being able to talk to somebody. It's a little isolating at times. And then uh, um, I'll say lastly, um, you know, I don't want to, we do have a uh, giving Tuesdays on the 29th and we have a hundred percent match on that day for donations thanks to the generosity of a of a of a donor and so any donation that you make to our charity on that day will be doubled so if you give 25 bucks he'll match 25 bucks be a 50 dollars gift which would go a long way in helping us kind of get to the next phase of our organization so if you Damn. have the means to give and you feel inclined to uh we'd really appreciate that as well k money's fitting the bill for that yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where he's getting the money from, but uh, <laughs> no, no, he's he's not. It's a, it's a, uh, it's from a foundation. It's called the the Joe and Debbie Shoker Foundation. Um, is doing it, so we're extremely appreciative for them and their support. Hell yeah, man! We need to do more for Giving Tuesday as well. Um, I'm gonna work on that, and and maybe we can run a collab too at some point. Um, yeah, we definitely need to do that. But as far as yeah, uh, we need to get you guys on our podcast sometime. Yeah, let's do it. We'd love that. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, the Blue Skies Foundation goes, uh, at the end of this week, we're dropping some will be hoodies that are limited edition. So um, those will come out uh, on the on the website tomorrow to sign up for the launch, um, and then the text will go out on Friday for those who have the opportunity to buy one. Uh, and then, uh, coming up for black Friday, cyber Monday, we're going to be doing a, a sale where 15% of the profits, um, go to the foundation. So from the between foundation, uh, yeah, you want to run a collab, <laughs> but, uh, no. So 15% of all of our sales for Brotalian. So 15% of all of our sales from the Brotalian website between Friday and Monday of, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, uh, will go to the foundation. So typically we do like a, you know, 15% off site wide sale, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, but this year we're going to, you know, just have 15% of all the sales donated. So, um, so yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Um, more to come with the foundation and yeah, hopefully we can work a collab in at some point, maybe, maybe focused around mental health, maybe focused around physical health or, or something like that. But, uh, it's definitely something we'd love to do and, and we would love to come on your podcast as well. So just let us know when. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Before we close out, I just wanted to end it with a quote that I found on the BMF, uh, website by Billy Graham that I thought was awesome. And that's uh, a good coach will impact more people in one year than the average person will in a lifetime. So thanks again for what you're doing, brother, and uh, and for sharing your story and your mission with us and our audience. No problem. Anytime. Thank you guys for having me.